this is a story to demonstrate how time passes. Um, Marion and I both showed up in San Antonio about the same time, and and as well as Maurice, for that matter. And uh, one of the first things I remember happening is when Marion and I, our, our, our toddler daughters, I mean like toddlers, were both ca carried in the San Antonio Express News for the decoration of their nurseries. And those toddler daughters are in their 30s and Marion and I are grandparents. So <laughs> time goes really, really fast. Uh, Dr. Marion Edinger is, the culture, is a cultural anthropologist and art historian who specializes in Latin American art and culture. That doesn't sound like much for the person that is literally at the top of the heap in this field in North America. This guy, I am honored to introduce him. Uh, as long as I have known him, he's been the curator of Latin American art at the San Antonio Museum of Art, and as of this year, he is retired and is the curator of Emeritus. His research and publication experience is too extensive to review. My favorite is the last one he did, which he compiled and edited, San Antonio 718, Art from Mexico. Uh, Trinity University Press published it, and there was an accompanying exhibit, which was fabulous. And I know he thought about that project for a long time before it happened. Um, I could go on and on, but you're here to hear about him, and as I said, he has, if he has done it, if it has happened, he did it when it comes to Latin American art and folk art. He is the, the top of the pile, and please welcome Dr. Marion Edinger. Thank you for those generous words, and what a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, the Witty for including me in this special uh, project, and I particularly want to uh, thank Maurice, there you are, Maurice, and also to say how much uh, I admire what you've done. And, uh, you know, in many respects, I always thought that you were given lemons and you made the best lemonade in the Southwest, I'll tell you that. And lemons in terms of other, a lot of things, I'm not, but <laughs> Louis, no, but it just, this museum is absolutely astonishing. It gets better every year and the programming and um, the exhibit, exhibitions are always ambitious and they are always successful and we're so proud uh, of what you've done. Thank you. And Maurice has got a, you know, she's a grandmama too. So I'd also uh, like to uh, uh, thank the curators of this exhibit, which I haven't seen, but I'm going to see after this if I'm not too long-winded. And, um, you know, Ron's the best around. And Michael, I didn't know until today. And you can tell that he's uh, also somebody who really um, has spent his time in the ditches and really knows the subject uh, beautifully. Um, and of course, you always think that if you're a specialist that you pretty much know at any given time everything there is to know about your subject. Um, we also know that every event that you attend and every person you talk to uh, sends you back to the uh, drawing board and you have to re sort of think things. And my topic today on, on uh, Father Mar Hill, um, I have thought about Father Mar Hill for the past eight or nine years, and I have seen every image there is of Father Mar Hill until about an hour ago when I was talking to Ron, and he said, oh yes, and I really like that full length that's at the San Jacinto Museum. I said, what? Never heard. It's been there since well, the 1930s. I mean, my lord. You know, it's a little embarrassing, but it's all right. Uh, that's okay. It happens every day in our business. Good. Wonderful. Well, you're lucky because it's a very fine image, which I've never seen. It's never been published. 
And I want to thank uh, Mary Margaret. Mary Margaret, is Mary Margaret here? She must be tending to other duties, but Mary Margaret uh, uh, McAllen did a wonderful job of putting things together and uh, uh, riding herd on, um, you know, a group of Texans and would-be Texans. Um, and I want to thank Bruce uh, again for his kind words and uh, for reminding me of that newspaper piece, which I still have, but I've given to my children. Now I'll have to go back and look at it again. Um, let me see if I can do this. Okay. Fray Antonio Marhil de Jesus was famous during his lifetime as an exemplary Franciscan friar, a brilliant and passionate evangelist, a gifted scholar of indigenous language, languages, and a fearless worker for the Catholic Church in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Known especially for his humble demeanor, he walked barefooted to all his posts throughout New Spain and fasted almost every day of the year. He customarily signed his name La Misma Nada, or Nothing Itself. Mar Hill is often referred to as the patron saint of Texas. So my presentation this afternoon is going to focus on the life of uh, Father uh, Mar Hill. Um, and notes, uh, hopefully, will note his rightful, uh, albeit largely unknown, place in the foundation, evangelization, and the settlement of San Antonio and other parts of northern Spain. In addition, it explores visual representations of Mar Hill through surviving paintings, sculptures, works on papers, as well as works of art commissioned by him during his time in northern uh, New Spain, primarily in Zacatecas. And for those of you who don't, are not familiar with, with, with Mexico, Zacatecas is a big mining town, uh, sort of halfway between here and Mexico City. Finally, uh, I want to examine various examples of popular theater uh, employed uh, by Mar Hill for the propagation of the tenets of the Franciscan faith. Can, if you've got a, is it, is, are the lights dim enough for you to see this? Well, I, do, I want to make sure you don't turn the light off on the podium. Well, maybe that's, if it's all right with y'all, I'm, I'm fine. I really didn't know much about uh, Fray uh, Antonio Marhil de Jesus uh, until um, I uh, was involved um, when I was director of the museum in putting together uh, a binational uh, exhibition on uh, art of the missions of northern New Spain. It was about 10 years ago. And um, it was uh, co-organized by the San Antonio Museum of Art, uh, San Aldefonso in Mexico City, and the uh, Oakland Museum of Art. And we split budgets, and we split uh, time, and we did essays together, and so forth. And <clears throat> most of the material came from Mexico. A lot of it was all about conservation and finding things in places like uh, Paras and uh, Chihuahua and Saltillo in the northern part of, of New Spain, and about uh, the way they raise funds, which was one of the results of the uh, exhibition, to restore these pieces for exhibition and thereby preserving them for the churches, because these are things that came out of churches, living churches and uh, active parishes and so forth. I heard uh, of the existence of a painting here in San Antonio that was part of the collection of Our Lady of the Lake uh, University. And so I went out uh, to take a look at it. 
and it was this painting. And it was um, uh, a painting that was probably done around uh, 1770. And it, of course, is a Father uh, Marheel. And it's done by an academic, uh, very popular, um, important painter uh, of the middle of the 18th century, Nicolas Enriquez. And he was either from Mexico City or from uh, Guadalajara. So um, I decided uh, to sort of explore the life of, to, well, first of all, to ask if we could borrow this for that exhibit when uh, it opened in San Antonio. And the understanding was that since they don't have a museum at Our Lady of the Lake, that we would have it uh, at the museum on long-term uh, loan uh, and that we would pay for the conservation. So we had had it conserved, uh, and there was a big split right down the middle of it, and we had it conserved, and so everybody, I think, became a winner on this. Um, so this led my interest to um, continue, uh, and I started doing archival research. I started working uh, on Father Marheel in Mexico. I started working on things uh, about him, uh, in the archives in Alston uh, and in other uh, sources of information. Uh, the Franciscans were the first mendicant order authorized uh, to baptize and to convert indigenous populations after the fall of Tenochtitlan in 1521. According to Cristina Cruz Gonzalez, a leading scholar on uh, Franciscan art history in New Spain, their presence in Mexico can really be divided into three celebrated periods. Uh, this first period uh, is 18, uh, 1524 uh, through uh, 1580, and it includes people like Pedro de Gante uh, and the original 12, you know, the Franciscans represent Christ, and St. Francis modeled his life after Christ. And um, so throughout this art that I'll be showing you, you see this imitation of Franciscans who are members of the order of St. Francis. And St. Francis' life was modeled after Christ with suffering and certain uh, pivotal uh, moments. But the original 12, they were the most powerful order uh, to come to the Americas. And the original uh, 12 uh, was headed by Pedro de Gant, uh, who was uh, related, uh, a cousin of Charles V, which always helps. And we're told that, um, that Cortez, uh, who had a very busy life uh, in Tenochtitlan, uh, gave up time uh, right after uh, the fall of Tenochtitlan and made a special trip down to the coast uh, to meet uh, the uh, 12 disciples, uh, the, the original 12 uh, Franciscans who came in. Those 12 Franciscans during this first period of uh, 1524 to 1580 uh, included the great linguist who did the first Nahuatl dictionary by the name of uh, Alonso de Molina, Bernardo de Sahagún, who was the father of American ethnographic studies. And for any of you who have never heard of uh, Bernardino de Sahagún, it, it's worth uh, paying attention to and uh, pursuing read something on this, plenty written in English, plenty written on his life. He published over a period of 30 years, he published 12 great volumes which were bound into three, uh, 12 books divide, uh, bound into three uh, volumes uh, which were sent back uh, to Europe and now a part of the um, uh, Laurentian Library uh, in Florence. And it's just an extraordinary um, study. But these were all people. They set up schools to educate uh, uh, 
uh, Nahuatl uh, indigenous children. And unfortunately, they also taught them how to squeal on their parents when their parents started uh, backsliding and so forth. Um, but this is that first period which was really the most illustrious in the, gold, the real golden age of uh, Franciscan, the Franciscan presence in, in Mexico. The second uh, period is from about uh, 1581 to 1682, and that's when students that came out of these schools um, became real uh, zealously involved in uh, the uh, uh, evangelization of indigenous populations. Uh, Diego Valadez, who for the show that I did related uh, to 1718, uh, I was able to borrow the publication that he did called, uh, called a Rhetorica Christiana. And it's one of those wonderful 15th century, 16th century uh, illustrations done in Latin, the, uh, books done in Latin with a hundred plates uh, showing the conversion techniques and so forth and the University of Texas at Austin the Benson in their rare book collection they very generously loaned it to the exhibition which was a real um, a coup for us and we were real proud of that. Also Torquemada who was another uh, scholar of that particular period and a, my, a man by the name of Geronimino uh, de Mendieta. So there were these students who were uh, brought up um, uh, under the guidance of the earlier generations who made their contributions as well. And religious orders, uh, you know, fall in and out of favor. People become more powerful, less powerful. Uh, you know, with, uh, at the end of the 18th century, at the end of the 16th century, uh, the Franciscans learned that they had to sort of share uh, some power with the Dominicans and with others, uh, the Jesuits and uh, the Augustinians. Uh, and by the end of the 17th century, the Franciscans had really didn't have anybody at the table in Rome. And then all of a sudden, they received a, a tremendous um, boost uh, with a, a new pope and they received uh, a tremendous amount of, of um, support. And there was a renaissance in Franciscan uh, evangelization and teaching and presence and so forth. And they are also noticing that this is a couple of years, a couple of hundred years after the arrival of the, uh, of the Spanish and already Christians we're starting to, as they used to say in the Baptist Church in North Carolina, where I'm from, there were already backsliders. And so there were these two new uh, audience. Not only were they interested in evangelization as, uh, the, as uh, Spanish society, or uh, New Spain society pushed north, but they were also trying to remind and um, Evangel re evangelize uh, Creole societies uh, who they were finding along the way and remind them that they needed to get back in church and atone for their sins. Um, and part of this group uh, is uh, a man by the name of uh, Antonio Linais uh, and uh, Junipero Serra, you know, who uh, later founded all the California missions and uh, Fra, uh, Fra uh, Antonio Marheel was a major part of this third Renaissance kind of golden age. Marheel uh, was born in Valencia, Spain in 1657, and um, he took his Franciscan vows in 1673. He signed up uh, as a missionary uh, to come to the Americas. He was really uh, passionately involved in, uh, interested in field work. And he, um, in 1682, uh, he joined uh, Linnaeus, uh, who had been appointed by Rome to establish colleges uh, in 
uh, Mexico City and North on the propagation, called for the propagation of faith in New Spain. And these were gonna be colleges that would, would uh, be monasteries and convents that would uh, push out and evangelize uh, primarily indigenous people. Uh, and he left Cadiz in, in 1683 uh, for Veracruz. And um, it's kind of interesting. I'll show you. Let me see if I've got that. Uh, and this is a composite map that I did for uh, a previous uh, talk that I gave. And as you can see, he left and went to everything stopped in Havana for a while and he went to uh, Veracruz, and of course it would take forever to get to these places. Um, and it was his good fortune, because he was relatively young, and the man that had been appointed by the, um, the Pope and, and Rome to carry out uh, this, the establishment of these colleges, Linnaeus, turned out to be his roommate aboard ship and they became uh, very, very close friends. And an interesting story, one, one account of their trip uh, to Veracruz um, is they arrived and laid, sort of uh, laid off the coast there. Uh, but when they uh, talked to people and when they were able to see uh, through um, magnifying glasses or through uh, telescopes, that um, it was being occupied by pirates. Veracruz was completely being sacked and um, you know, people were being murdered and it was just constant. So he, they went further to the north uh, a couple of days and kind of laid off of the coast of Veracruz between the city and uh, Tampico until things kind of calmed down and they uh, then uh, made their way into Veracruz and tended to uh, the destruction uh, and set up a little hospital and so forth. Their mission uh, initially was to establish, and let's see if I can do this without, if I can do this without setting they, uh, their mission initially, of course, you, everything had to go through Mexico City, which was, is, is now described, has always been described even by the Aztecs as el ombligo del mundo, the belly button of the world, which it is. Um, but they went up here to uh, Querétaro, which was another uh, very, very wealthy mining town. And in 1683, they, um, they uh, started, uh, found it was the, the director was Father Linnaeus, uh, but uh, very quickly he appointed uh, Mar Hill to be a co founder and he was going to be in charge of doing most of the field work. And so they established a, a college, uh, the College of uh, Santa Cruz, uh, to proselytize the north and you have to realize and as soon as that sort of enterprise uh, was put together in Querétaro father whoops let me see let me go back here father Marheel um, who really did not like administrative work he was really someone who liked to be in the field and liked to be uh, actively sort of hands-on and so he immediately started uh, visiting places around uh, Querétaro and ended up going all the way down to uh, Central America, Costa Rica. He went into the Maya uh, area of Yucatan and even lived with the La Condone for a while. Well the La Condone, I mean when I was in college and I'm, I'm I'm old, but I'm not this old. Um, but the La Condone were always really very, very isolated, but he spent time uh, proselytizing there. And his job was to establish these branches in these smaller colleges. 
And one of the ones that, uh, for those of you who know Guatemala, you know the original capital of, of uh, colonial capital was in Antigua. Okay. Pardon me? Attention, Witty Museum visitors. The museum will be closing in 15 minutes. Upgrade your ticket to a Witty Museum membership and visit all year. I'll pay. I'll buy. I'll give you, the, <laughs> I'll give you, my, give you my honorarium. I'm a <laughs> Anyhow, so um, he, he just, his biography is filled with all of these examples, but is in Antigua, Guatemala, he set up a college uh, devoted uh, to uh, educating a recently converted uh, priest, uh, not priests, but uh, young men who were uh, devoted to becoming uh, friars. Uh, and uh, they even built, and I have photographs in storage, uh, of uh, a number of uh, churches that are in ruin because right after it took like five years for all that to happen, and after it was built, um, he uh, there was an earthquake in in uh, Antigua which destroyed most of those wonderful colonial structures that you see in ruin in uh, Antigua. Um, so um, that was kind of uh, I'm sure a big uh, disappointment. But he would always come back and touch base uh, in the mothership, if you will, which was in Querétaro. Uh, so, um, let me go forward here. So, uh, back to seven, uh, 1683, when he and uh, uh, Father um, Linnaeus founded uh, the uh, College of Santa Cruz uh, in Querétaro, this is what the college looks like uh, today. Uh, and to the right, uh, there is a, uh, a convent or monastery, which would have been um, for uh, the, it was a colegio for the proselytization uh, of Franciscans who wanted to be missionaries. Um, and in front of this, and this of course is the facade of the, of the church, uh, and then the parish church is to the left there. And in the front is a, a modern uh, sculpture uh, which shows um, uh, Mar Hill uh, as he is going on one of his many pilgrimages and his trips of evangelization. And he always um, went barefooted. Well, I don't even go in the backyard barefooted uh, in South Texas. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just a lot of critters out there. But he, uh, marched all over uh, New Spain uh, barefooted and refused uh, to carry, uh, he always carried his, uh, his own luggage, we're told, uh, particularly if there was a crowd that was uh, gathered. He wanted to make sure that people understood that he was not um, uh, living, a, living a life of, um, of, of pleasure and uh, abundance and so forth. And his travels were such that um, he was referred to by one uh, biographer as a friar with winged feet. I mean, just think about the time it took just to go from Querétaro to Mexico City. It would take, you know, a month or so. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Now, as I mentioned, uh, there's, a nut, there's an attending statue in front of, uh, of Santa Cruz, and it's of Junipero Serra. And Junipero Serra was the generation that followed uh, Mar Hill. But he became, as I'll mention a little later, he became the, um, the model uh, of um, humbleness and so forth, uh, the perfect priest according to uh, Serra. And uh, so he modeled his life in California uh, after uh, Mar Hill. Um, inside the church itself uh, is still an active parish. 
Um, but <clears throat> there's very little left of, of the con of the uh, the monastery and the colegio. Uh, the right after independence, uh, they didn't fare really well uh, because it, it was a royal uh, kind of. Their allegiances were to the crown, for the most part, and uh, so, you know, and there was a struggle with the church and so forth. So, it kind of was abandoned. And then, in 1840, uh, the U.S. troops uh, in the 1840s, uh, U.S. troops billeted uh, uh, troops there uh, in uh, preparation for the assault on Mexico City. Um, Maximilian uh, and uh, Mary Margaret, you know, as you know better than anybody uh, in the room or maybe in the world, um, he was imprisoned there uh, uh, up until the day of his uh, execution in 1867. So it's been a place that's been really secularized. And today, if you go and ask for a tour, it's really go to look at the old cot that Maximilian was said to have you know, spent his last days on, and the rooms are here and there, and it's really kind of embarrassing. Uh, however, there is a, a room that I found interesting. Um, up above uh, the, the, the nave of the parish church, which is joined, as they usually are, joined to the monastery, and um, it's this particular painting uh, here is a mural, and this painting is dated 1922. Well, it was particularly interesting because I went down and I had borrowed also from a private collection a copper painting by Nicholas Enriquez of this painting, which is the fruits of, uh, of the Holy Cross. And it has Linnaeus here. And it has our friend Mar Hill as a evangelizing missionary uh, right here. And then here are all the personages who are important uh, to the Franciscan order. And of course, members of the order, some martyred and some not. And it depicts a scene right outside of um, Queretaro. So the relationship between this, which is uh, from sometime around 1770, and this uh, became very, very interesting. And, um, but this is the only thing that's left. And as far as I can tell, and my idea is that this was redone uh, later uh, based on a mural that must have been in that space going back to the uh, late 17th, early 18th uh, century. Uh, if you go into San Fernando, which is another Franciscan uh, church, or if you even go into Teposotlan, which is Jesuit, you see uh, these great uh, genealogical trees of orders that uh, are used to remind uh, new uh, novitiates uh, of the sacrifices made by and the missions that they have uh, for their um, members. Now, so they, after any art that was associated with that church, any important colonial art, has been moved downtown uh, to the Regional Museum of Queretaro. And this is one of the portraits that, uh, of Mar Hill, dressed as a mendicant and um, as he walks across uh, his area. And he's always carrying a staff here. And legend has it that when he came home back to Queretaro from a long mission of several years, uh, he would put his staff in the ground of Queretaro, and it would take root and produce this tree, which is a thorny shrub bush and it has a thorn that's exactly in the shape of a cross. So today, when you go on Sundays uh, to the parish church, there are several dozen uh, booths that sell little, little packages of these crosses. 
uh, that come from these, these bushes in the area and the story of the, the miracle that's related to it. So as I mentioned, the church uh, was abandoned, really. So um, after uh, about 20 years of doing field work uh, in other parts uh, of New Spain, it was decided that he would go to Zacatecas, which is north of Querétaro, if you recall, and uh, which I really suggest that you go there. There are probably 15 different museums, and this is uh, the home of um, the, um, the, prop, the, the Colegio de, Prop uh, de Propaganda Fide, the Guadalupe of uh, Zacatecas, and the idea was to push further north to be closer to, uh, to make incursions into what they call the Comancheria, uh, which, of course, we're all a part of, but to get further up so that you can, you know, deal with uh, New Mexico and Arizona and uh, Texas and so forth. And so this is a church, 18th century church, uh, very, very Baroque. It's called Churiguresque. Uh, that was, that's the parish church. Uh, and this is the Colegio, which is uh, uh, right next door. Now, it was while he was in Querétaro, or in Zacatecas, uh, which he founded in uh, 1703, that he started making these incursions into Texas. He would put somebody in charge and then hit the road. And of course, when the French, it was a treaty with the French of East Texas, uh, and those Catholics pushed the Catholics from uh, Spain out of there, and he brought them to uh, Texas. They founded three of the of our five uh, missions here, uh, and however, the earlier missions, I mean, like what we know as the Alamo uh, and um, other missions uh, in this area, were founded under his direction along with Linnaeus. And, and so San Jose was one of the things that, that was not the way it existed uh, at the moment of his, um, of his uh, foundation. Now, the, the, the piece that I just showed you, of course, is a Gentil painting that belongs to um, uh, St. Mary's, and it's a later edition of it. I mean, it was done around 1900. He made plenty, many copies of earlier paintings. Um, but um, anyhow, uh, this shows, and while, it, so he lived in San Antonio uh, and founded the missions, and this is a later, this is like 50 years later, this painting here. Uh, but while he was in San Antonio, um, he became ill, his, he was wearing out, he was just a young man, but he was wearing out, and um, he got very, very ill, and they decided he would return to Mexico, uh, and so from San Antonio, he went to, to Zacatecas, and then from Zacatecas, they sent him to Querétaro, and then from uh, Querétaro, he went to San Francisco uh, in Mexico City, and uh, passed away in, uh, in uh, 1726. Um, he was buried uh, in the cathedral, uh, and then they later uh, reburied him uh, in uh, Querétaro, and, and then moved him to Zacatecas, and he's interred there. Um, he was also uh, put on, uh, nominated for uh, canonization, but uh, that's still sort of in medio camino, as they say. Um, you know, these things start out with a lot of support and then politics change around the world and they, you know, so forth. So he uh, <coughs> has yet to be, but there is, a, I understand, a movement that um, uh, to have him reintroduced uh, for sainthood. Now, during this uh, third Franciscan Golden Age, um, the Franciscans continued to use paintings, prints, and sculptures 
to combat sin and to illustrate the missions, their mission of conversion. By the 18th century, two, uh, Thank you for visiting the Witty Museum. The museum two, and as I mentioned, there were two groups of uh, two goals of conversion. One was, you know, indigenous people, new, newly encountered indigenous people, and backsliding Spaniards and Creoles. Um, but taking off on the way he used uh, paintings and so forth to proselytize, um, Zacatecas College uh, has an extraordinary collection of paintings uh, which are very important and illustrate uh, the uh, Franciscan narrative. And you have to realize that this is a, a, a enormous college. It would have been a cloister. Uh, and the art that's there, for the most part, is the art that was in situ uh, in the first years of its founding. So he commissioned uh, and, and directed that uh, art uh, be used uh, to carry the mission uh, idea of, and one of the great painters, you know this, uh, is The Mystical City of God uh, by Cristobal de Villopando. And this is one of the first uh, works that, uh, one of the, the many works by this great painter, uh, you know, the Met two years ago did a one-man show uh, on Via Pondo, and he is really, I, to my way of thinking, always has been, um, has been the most outstanding of the late uh, 17th and early 18th century paintings. But um, there are many works by Vio Pondo, and it was um, this particular piece was painted around the time uh, of the opening of the Evangelical College, um, and it shows. Uh, Sor Maria de Agrida, uh, who is shown right here, who was a Spanish mystic, and of course, John the Evangelist. And they are um, writing about the uh, Virgin of Guadalupe and how she represents uh, the mystical city of God. Um, and Guadalupe, of course, is is a manifestation of the Immaculate Conception. So this is the Immaculada, and it becomes Guadalupe, and that's the reason that Guadalupe is the name of the church, and that's why our church of uh, San Jose, uh, the principal figure is Guadalupe. I mean, I said, well, why don't they have San Miguel or, or Guadalupe? Or why don't they have San Miguel or San Jose? But it's all very, very complicated, but um, she becomes the, manifest, the American manifestation of uh, the Immaculate Conception. So anyhow, so that's one of the first, and we, we borrowed this, thank goodness we're able to get this, this painting. Now let me show you inside of uh, this colegio, and there are a series of paintings by Miguel uh, Cabrera, and the remarkable thing, and here's a great stairwell painting that's about uh, almost 20 feet tall. And you, can, whoops, and you can see here that, whoops, whoops. You can see here how enormous, and it's a very difficult thing to photograph, but it's by Miguel Cabrera. And it's called the, uh, done in 1765, after Mar Hill had died. And it's the patronage of the Virgin of Guadalupe over the Franciscans uh, is another uh, of these, of one of many Cabrera paintings. But I wanted to just show you that makes this really uh, unique. As you see up here, St. Francis of the Franciscans of the Order, including our friend, uh, right here is our friend, so 
another likeness that's available uh, to us. And so um, you start asking questions about, uh, yeah, Q&A. Well, give me five more minutes, OK. OK, Q&A, OK. So um, anyhow, here's a, and I'm not going to talk to my notes. Uh, so you wonder, well, how do they supply places in the hinterlands with art? Do they take artists up to live in, you know, Katula? Or do they take them, you know, places in South Haiti? Do they take artists up to live in the hinterlands? Or do they use local artists? Or do they probably use a bit of a mixture of those things? But they also um, use scrolls and they use traditions like artists in the Middle East. So the scrolls and the traditions and the support of the Katula to either help the world be saved or for a lot of concept art in Uh, evangelizing uh, groups in Mexico. Now, you wonder, when we did the exhibit, um, we luckily were able to include an ornament, which is, I, I've always said, north of here, and uh, it's a painting that was done and attributed to uh, Jose de Paez. And uh, the reason I show this is that uh, this is in the early stages. It would not last until the massacre in the National Falls was played out in 19th century photographs of Jesuit uh, missions in Baja California with priests of photographs standing out uh, front with scroll paintings um, proselytizing. Now inside, this is Four paintings. I'm not going to deal with all of them. 
um, but they were show the life of um, of St. Francis. And again, it's all done uh, to show how close he was to Christ. And it begins with the birth of, of St. Francis, and then it goes to this child rearing and to his, uh, his father. It's a very, very kind of complex story. The father went into the business, and uh, he said, No, I want to be in the spiritual world. So he became uh, a, a, uh, a religious leader and then he found it but anyhow this is one of the 24 uh, paintings and I'll show you here is when you receive the stigmata the seraphim up here that's another one of the paintings in this sequence and then here's the death of St. Francis and guess who attended the death of St. Francis To cut this short because I'm, I know y'all are ready for a drink, uh, <clears throat> but um, let me just show you this last thing because this is really wonderful, uh, and it carries on after this. Um, if you go again, as I mentioned. So that kind of leads me into this whole thing about, about uh,
popular theater, but I'm not going to have a chance to. But let me just finish by saying um, that uh, So I tried to date all of this, and I found in reading a recent biography of Junipero Serra, who was the generation after um, Marjil, uh, the Franciscans, um, let's see, hold on a minute, I've written this in a very organized fashion. Oh yeah, here it is. Um, both uh, you know, Franciscans of both periods, the time of, of uh, Father Marheel and of uh, Serra, employed dramatic performances 50 years apart. Changes, uh, there were changes however. Historian Stephen Hackle's interesting 2013 publication called Junipero Serra, California's Founding Father, states that in Serra's time, 50 years after Marheo, the Franciscan College forbade the missionaries to bring with them certain theatrical props for use during sermons such as crucifixes with attachments and hinges that allowed the padres to make Christ's eyes open and close and his arms and legs to move. So it was part of other examples of popular theater, but are there any questions? 